Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to all attendees um, this evening for this information session about Churchill Fellowships. Uh, my name is Adam Davey. I'm the CEO of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I think the webinar's just started. I went a bit early. My name's Adam Davey. I'm the CEO of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust uh, based here in Canberra, Ngunnawal and Nambri country. I'm going to begin this information session with an overview of what Churchill Fellowships are all about, um, how you apply and the sorts of things that we're looking for. And then you're going to hear from uh, two Churchill Fellows, Greg Toman and uh, Fiona Ewington, and I'll introduce them more fully um, in a short while. I would like to firstly acknowledge Australia's uh, First Nations people, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to welcome any Aboriginal uh, and or Torres Strait Islander people who are watching this session from whichever part of uh, country you're on. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping, you'll be able to submit some questions throughout this webinar via the Q&A function. Um, we may answer some of those uh, as we go because we expect to get quite a few questions, but at the end, you'll get a chance to ask questions of, um, of Greg, Fiona uh, or myself. Um, and if we've answered any particularly um, interesting ones, we'll also uh, call them out so that everyone can have the benefit of um, hearing those questions and answers. But if you do miss the opportunity or you think of something um, tonight that you didn't ask during the webinar, uh, feel free to get in touch with the Trust via Facebook or our website or call the Trust and we'll be happy to um, speak with you and answer any questions you might have. So I'll just share my um, slide deck with you now. Okay, so um, a little bit of history I think is quite important um, for you to understand before you apply for a Churchill Fellowship. Um, when Winston Churchill resigned as British Prime Minister in 1955 at 80 years of age, he'd served under five reigning monarchs. He'd survived three wars. He'd been a writer, an historian, a journalist, and a painter. He'd even won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953. There was a widespread desire to honour the great man and to capture the essence of his public service, his inspiration, his intellect, and even his humour for generations to come. Now, we all accept that Sir Winston wasn't perfect, and you can read some really insightful essays uh, that are on our website that explore Churchill through a contemporary lens. But what's clear is that he was a man who readily believed anything was possible if he put your mind to it, and that the greatest figures in history were those who made a contribution to public service and to their fellow countrymen. When Prime Minister Menzies announced the news of Sir Winston's death to Australians in January 1965, he simultaneously announced the national fundraising event that would establish the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust, and through that, the creation and award of Churchill Fellowships. On Churchill Memorial Sunday, 28th of February 1965, a doorknock appeal was launched, and over 220,000 Australians participated with strong support from our Return Services League, and around £2.2 .2 million, or around $4 million, was raised. So this was one of Australia's largest public fundraising efforts. And I think today it remains so. In fact, it was the only time that banks opened on a Sunday so the money could be deposited. So if you have a passion for a subject you wish to investigate overseas and you know what you're striving to achieve and you have a desire to make a difference in your industry or community within Australia, then a church or fellowship can help you to realise your aspirations. So what, you know, what are the attributes of a church or fellow? We do know from our research and from talking to fellows that many applicants are motivated by a desire to bring about change and to improve outcomes for people or the planet. The Churchill Fellows are the types of people who are passionate and committed to an issue. They want to learn and share knowledge so that others in their community may also benefit. A Churchill Fellowship is a unique and prestigious opportunity that is open to Australians from all walks of life. Now, Church of Fellowship is more than just a study abroad program. It's an opportunity to become an expert in your field and make a real impact in the world. 
So it's not an academic scholarship and it's not a funding grant. It's much bigger than that. It's bigger than the overseas trip. That's an important part, an in integral part of the fellowship, but it's bigger than that. It's the start of a lifelong journey and a contribution to make Australia better. And it's important to understand that a Churchill Fellowship does not need to comprise formal research. You can learn new skills. You can undertake a course. You can build networks and observe best practice in your chosen field in the way that's appropriate to you and your industry or your sector. The fellowship is for overseas travel only. And Rose has appeared. Hi, Adam. Sorry to interrupt you. I know that your slides are really worth seeing, so I just want to mention that we can just see the top of your window at the moment. We've got a few um, participants keen to see what you're showing as well, so it might just be a bit oh, of a... Oh, my window. Okay, I will just see what is going on. Because, of course, I made the mistake of testing the sharing of the slides at the start, and it worked fine. Totally. How does that grab you? Perfect. Thanks. All right, excellent, excellent. So, um, as I was saying, um, a church of fellowship is for overseas travel only and must be between four to eight weeks and taken in one continuous journey. And there are some changes and some exceptions to that, which I'll cover off. We've awarded nearly four and a half thousand church of fellowships since 1965. And each year, there are typically around 100 church of fellowships that we award across Australia. And they're usually proportional to the populations in each state and territory. So um, what we know is that um, from recent research, around 83% of Churchill Fellowships report, uh, Churchill Fellows reported that their Churchill Fellowship helped them to achieve their goals within three to five years. And Churchill Fellows travel across the globe on the widest range and depth of topics and bring back to this country information, networks, projects, products, ideas, and innovations which can help make this country stronger. So are you eligible? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you need to be an Australian citizen or a permanent resident of Australia and aged 18 years or older by the application closing date, which is 1 May this year. The ability to travel overseas is obviously essential and we can provide support for you if you have a disability um, or a similar barrier to traveling. Uh, we also now offer virtual research options for people who cannot travel due to disability or caring responsibilities. And for people living in very remote parts of Australia, we're also offering domestic travel. So if this might be you, I encourage you to get in, trust, in touch with us at the Trust to um, find out a bit more about how that will work. A church or fellowship is an individual project, so it's not a team project. And I, I do make a point of saying this because it's not uncommon each year for um, usually research teams from an institution wanting to apply as a team, but you can't do that. This is an individual award and it's an individual project. That said, you know, you can come back from your fellowship and collaborate. We want to see that. We want to see you implement things and that can be with your team but only one um, person applies from your team. So it is important to understand that when we say a church or fellowship is for all people from all walks of life, we really do mean it. That gets thrown around by a lot of organisations, um, but for us, it's really critical that we make the church or fellowships available as broadly as we can to as many Australians as we can. So in terms of your projects, it must be suitable for a fellowship. And effectively, that means it must benefit the Australian community in some way. So you going overseas and coming back to share knowledge, ideas, innovations, practices, skills, whatever it is, that needs to in some way benefit the Australian community. And that can be, you know, uh, very practical or it can be, you know, a cultural benefit through something in the arts. We're not really strict on that, but you need to be able to explain to us what will the benefit be to the Australian community in you undertaking the fellowship? You have to demonstrate that you fully explored the topic within Australia to be considered. We, what we don't want to do is send you overseas um, when you could learn what you want to learn in Australia already. So make sure that, that you can justify why you want to travel overseas. 
The project has to be self-contained, so it can't form part of a university degree. So that's important to understand. It's okay if you're studying at university. You'll need to convince us that you can make time to study at university and do a church or fellowship because, remember, it's not just the four to eight weeks. You come back and you need to be doing things, sharing your findings, working towards implementing the change that you want to see. So you can't use a fellowship as a sort of project to complete a university degree. Um, also, you can't use a church or fellowship as the overseas travel budget for a project that your organisation is funding. Um, it's okay if it's, you know, going to benefit your organisation. That, that's great. But don't sort of work it into that project. We want to make sure that we're investing in you. And these fellowships can cost around $30,000, give or take five or $10,000, depending where you go. Um, we want to make sure that you are dedicated to implementing your church or fellowship. It doesn't need to relate to your employment. So that's a question that comes up. Um, often it does. That makes good practical sense. If you're working in an industry or a sector, you're probably passionate about that issue and you've probably got a really good opportunity to influence in that sector or in that community. So it's okay if it relates to your employment, but it's also okay if it doesn't. You might have a passion outside of your work that you're committed to in your community, um, an art or uh, whatever it might be. And that's perfectly fine as well. What's important is that we don't set limits on the topics or issues. So you'd be surprised. Have a look through our website at all the different projects that we award. Um, this is really a strength of a church or fellowship. It could be practically on anything, anything that you're passionate about that you can draw a connection to your community on, then that project could be eligible. And unlike um, you know, many other grants and other programs, the beauty of a church or fellowship is that you design your own project. As I said, any topic, there's no limits, you tell us. Um, you know, where you're going, all those sorts of things, you, you decide. We do offer what we call sponsored fellowships and that can be the result of generous individuals or organisations agreeing to fund a fellowship on a specific topic, something that they want to see. Um, or it could be through a bequest and, and it's not uncommon for church or fellows to leave bequests to see um, more church of fellowships awarded on areas that were interesting or they were passionate about. Um, so have a look at our website, some examples that might be relevant to people tuning into this session tonight could be the Donald McKay Church of Fellowship, which was established in memory of Donald McKay. Um, and those topics would be ones that relate to countering organised crime. Or the NRMA Road Safety Trust, we have fellowships there which are designed for people whose projects are to reduce road um, trauma and injury um, from, from vehicle crashes, or the Lord Mayor's bushfire appeal, or the Bob and June um, Cricket Church of Fellowship focus on how we deal with natural disasters. So have a look on our website. Um, there are lots of sponsor fellowships you can choose from. But importantly, um, we'll identify suitable topics and applicants anyway, so you don't need to worry about, you know, should I choose one or not? We will be able to identify you. If you do select one when you apply, it doesn't rule you out from being selected for a general fellowship. So it, it's not going to advantage or disadvantage you either way. So of course you apply online as you'd expect and applications open on 1 March. Um, you won't see the application form until then um, and they close on 1 May. But you will find all the information that you need on our website. There's a button called Become a Fellow. I suggest if you haven't gone there, go to that website, um, churchofellowships.com.au become a fellow and have a look and read through all the information that we've made available. If you can't fill out the application form because, you know, there's a technical problem, you might have a screen reader that, that just doesn't um, gel with it, uh, that's fine. Please contact us. We'll find another way for you to apply. Um, we don't want people turned away because they couldn't use our form. Um, that said, it's a very straightforward form and, you know, the majority of you will be able to use it. It is a very uh, competitive process, so you're going to have to think about how are you going to convince the selectors to invest in you and your project idea. Now, um, the good news is this year there's a new part to our process. When you're filling out your form, you'll also be um, asked to provide a 60-second video pitch outlining your motivation for applying and the benefit to the community, so effectively telling us a little bit about yourself. And there's a recording tool a video recording tool in the um, form effectively that um, you can use. 
You will need uh, two references, someone who can vouch for you as a person, you know, your, your attributes, your ability to get the job done, your motivations, and someone who's a referee that is an expert in your topic. And they might be an expert in your field or someone with lots of experience in your, your industry who can effectively say, yes, this person's project is really important. It's something that you can't do in Australia or we need to do differently. And this would be great if they do it. So that's in a nutshell. And there's more information on the website about referees. The online form is fully automated. So you, you register using your mobile number and email address and you can log in, save as you go, leave it, come back, leave it, come back as much as you like. Um, number one tip, um, if you take nothing away from the session other than don't leave it to the last minute, then you're doing pretty well because um, the worst thing you can do is leave starting your application until the last minute. You just won't do a very good job. Um, you need time to really think about it. So I'd recommend um, reading our website first. As soon as the application form is available in March, start filling it out and, and getting yourself organised. Um, that's going to be a big benefit for you. Now, obviously, one of the main areas we consider is your itinerary. And effectively, um, what we want you to do is think carefully about where you want to go, which countries you want to go to, which cities, which people, which organisations, and importantly, why? What do you hope to learn from those organisations? So what you don't need to do is contact those people and those organisations and line up your meetings. You don't need to do that when you're applying, but you do need to think about who they'll be and where they'll be and set out your itinerary um, for between four to eight weeks. Um, what we do want you to do is think about time for yourself to reflect, to write notes, to experience the culture, to pick up meetings that, that spontaneously happen. So don't overcrowd your itinerary. We don't want to see applications where you've got 16 countries in four weeks. It's just not going to be feasible. So be really um, critical when you're thinking about where you need to go and factor in some time um, for yourself as well. You're allowed to have weekends. You're allowed to enjoy yourself. That's that's the good thing about a Churchill Fellowship. Um, it's important to perform the most complete itinerary you can at the point of application because that's what we'll assess you on. And when we award your fellowship, we, the trust, will have done all the work to cost out the airfares and accommodation and meal allowances. You don't need to do that. You just think about where you want to go. We will do the um, the costings. So be very specific in the information in your application. The selection process, um, we have panels and committees in each state and territory comprising experts from a range of fields and sectors. As you can imagine, applicants are shortlisted, taking into account referee comments. Then there are interviews held in New South Wales and Victoria. In particular, there are two rounds of interviews because of the large number of applicants. Um, our website will be updated um, with the dates as they're locked in for the, the various interviews so that you'll know what's going on. We have a staff member in each state and territory. We call them a regional secretary. They'll be your point of contact once you've submitted your application and applications closed. They'll keep you um, up to date in terms of what's happening with your application. Around half of those people interviewed are likely to get fellowships. So making it to an interview is a significant achievement. If you get an interview and you're not successful, you are allowed to apply again. So don't worry about that. Some people get their uh, Churchill Fellowship on the second or third attempt, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, this year, uh, keep an eye out on your calendar for early October, as if you're successful for the first time, we're going to be bringing all of the Churchill Fellows into Canberra for an onboarding session. And this is a deliberate move on our behalf to ensure that you maximise that networking opportunity with your cohort, and we'll do some training and things there for you as well to, I guess, make the Churchill Fellowship experience uh, as best as it can be. So we're often asked for tips about the application process and um, I've already given you the best one, which is don't leave it to the last minute. The next one is, um, you know, read and address the selection criteria. It's that simple. It, you know, the, the worst applications don't actually address the selection criteria. Use as little jargon as possible. Assume that, that the selection committee members aren't understanding the deep details of your project, particularly if it's on a technical issue. Try not to use jargon. If you have to, explain what it means. I guess plain plain words is the best way to go. 
So um, in terms of the selection criteria, there's kind of two halves to it. There's the project and the person. So when we're considering the project, we think about these points on the screen, the need for the project. What's compelling about your project? Is there a burning platform? Why is it the right time for you to be doing your church or fellowship now for you and for the community? What are the benefits? So specifically, how will your new knowledge or skills benefit others? Who will it benefit and why? Your itinerary, I've talked about that. You need to show a need to travel overseas. You need to have a clear focus. Um, you don't know what you don't know, which is fair enough, but you must be exploring something specific. So be clear about why you want to go somewhere and what you hope to learn. Um, be able to talk about why you've chosen those places to visit and who you'll be speaking with. And achievability. We want to believe, we need to believe that you're in a position to achieve what you're setting out to do with your project. So ways that you can make that clear would, I think, obviously be able to explain when you return from your fellowship with your new knowledge and your new skills and in your ideas, how connected are you here to the relevant parts of the community or the industry or the sector? You know, what are you going to be able to do when you come back? That's what we're going to want to hear from you. In terms of uh, personal attributes, Again, we want to know that you can maximise the opportunity. Why are you the right person to do this project? How are you best placed to come back and influence others or implement change? You know, you could say, to, oh, look, I'll get an article um, published in a professional journal. Well, that's great, but it's not really worth upwards of $30,000. We want to see more. You will be expected and required to create a quality report on your return. That's an obligation under the fellowship. But I don't want you to think about that as an obligation. Think about it as the opportunity to communicate and disseminate your church or fellowship experience, your insights and your recommendations for Australia. And it doesn't have to be a written report. It can be a video. It could be a podcast if you're creative. Just think about how you're going to communicate. We also offer lots of post travel opportunities, we can provide additional funding once you've done your fellowship to support you to disseminate your findings. We also provide personal growth, networking and leadership opportunities. We provide now an impact funding program so you can apply for some additional funds to help you implement your ideas back here in Australia. So really be clear, it's not just a short term funded overseas junket or holiday, far from it. It's an investment in you and your passion and your ideas. So just finally, remember it's a competitive process. Churchill Fellowships are prestigious. They open doors overseas and in Australia. They're well-funded and hotly contested. This isn't a reason to be shy. So it's the reason to put forward your best effort you can into your application. You'll be competing against everyone else who lodges an application and no doubt most of these people will satisfy the criteria. But think, you know, how well can you satisfy that criteria? How do you convince us that you're really the right person to do this? The Churchill Trust team in Canberra are available uh, to provide relevant advice information. Um, you should have these details on this final slide. You can see the uh, office number and also um, our website address. So that's a very sort of quick overview. I hope that you found that useful. I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and I'll introduce our um, first Churchill Fellow speaker, Greg Toman. Um, Greg is a passionate mountain man and his professional background in outdoor adventure guiding and instruction started back in 1991 when he was focusing on whitewater rafting, kayaking, rock climbing and bushwalking. So certainly a very adventurous uh, person. He was instrumental in establishing the swift water flood rescue discipline throughout Australia as well as in Indonesia and Malaysia. As a founding director of Outdoor Pursuits Group, Greg is responsible for developing and delivering a range of rock climbing, fire self rescue and cliff rescue courses. Greg was awarded his Churchill Fellowship in 2018 and his project was to enhance overall safety to both rescuers and those requiring rescue in remote rescue situations. On that note, I'm handing over to Greg. Thanks very much, Adam. If I can get my screen up now. Oops. 
All right, just bear with me one second. <clears throat> Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, so Greg Toman. Um, so yes, I received my Churchill Fellowship in 2018. Um, the topic was to enhance the overall safety of rescuers and those requiring rescue in mountainous and austere environments. I look for a good mix of mountain terrain, complexity of rescues and rescue techniques, which I found by traveling to Canada, USA, UK, Austria, France, and Italy. My research was heavily um, was based heavily around the 17 prepaid, oh, sorry, prepaid, pre-planned meetings, the National Mountain Rescue Conference, and specialty rescue courses. The additional meetings and contacts were also invaluable, as Adam uh, spoke about earlier on. So, for example, my primary contact with one of the busiest mountain rescue groups in the US arranged meetings for me with the Rocky Mountain National Park Specialist Climbing Rangers the Rocky Mountain Fire District Head of Mountain Rescue Training. And he also obtained last minute approval for me to sit in on a dynamic helicopter winch operation course at Buckley Air Force Base, um, conducted for the helicopter pilots and crew and the Colorado Mountain Rescue uh, Technicians. The eight week course, eight week, eight week research trip essentially opens the door to further networking and sourcing information um, after my return from Australia. I'm still re receiving and sharing information from other these contacts today. And by the way, for any of you in the government departments to cover the eight week trip, I use my annual leave, long service leave and obtain two weeks of special paid leave. The special paid leave required submission of an executive briefing note and approval by the Deputy Commissioner of the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. And because it involved overseas travel, it then required approval at a ministerial level. So as you can imagine, all this took time and wasn't a simple pro, um, process. So just sort of beware of that. For my research, I had clear objectives, as Adam was also talking about, with respect to the information I wanted to gather from the various rescue groups in the six countries I visited. Importantly, I left the door open to add other topics along the way that were identified as significant for rescuer and casualty safety. For example, the last three topics listed there, geolocation, stress injury, and psychological first aid were added within the first week. I actually used what I learned from the stress injury from my research to manage the stresses related to the demands at work and writing my Churchill report. Prior to departing Australia, I sent out to all my contacts a document detailing my research topics, along with more detailed breakdown of each section. For example, this is a breakdown for one section, which was rescue te techniques suitable for small rescue teams. These topic notes assisted people in preparing for the meetings and gathering any additional information they could share. This is also my prompt sheet through the actual meeting, so I didn't sort of get sidetracked and miss things. On advice from a past Churchill Fellow, these items became my tools of trade. A lightweight compact laptop or similar device suitable for taking um, with you everywhere. So my backpack just went everywhere with me. Can be used to show videos, presentations and documents during meetings and or storing photos, voice recordings and data obtained during the meetings. I accessed the internet and emails using free Wi-Fi at the airports and cafes, et cetera, or a hotspot off um, mobile phone. I'd suggest that you consider a compact external hard drive as a backup for storing photos, voice and video recordings and documents. External hard drive does not require the internet and it won't use your um, data from your data plan if you're um, using your mobile phone in different countries. The cloud-based storage when you have got access to that is also handy. To remain fully engaged with people at meetings and with their permission, I use the voice recorder. This valuable tool allowed me to visit, revisit all my meetings and make accurate notes from my report. I obtained approval from each person concerned prior to quoting them in my report. Where the research involves um, visual and audio related content, uh, I used a GoPro camera. On the same basis as the voice recorder, 
it allowed me to remain fully engaged while collecting information. I was also able to obtain digital photos, and images from the video footage to use in my report. Uh, the mobile phone um, was also a backup for the voice and video recorder, as well as being my camera, of course. Um, combined with a travel SIM card, I used WhatsApp and Messenger predominantly to correspond with individuals and organisations um, while I was travelling. The mobile phone was also used to take photos of my receipts um, that I needed for my tax return, so keep that in mind as well. And don't forget to take your Churchill Fellowship business card. Uh, so talking about highlights, um, there were so many highlights from my research, overseas research, but the standout would be being allowed to stay in a rundown caravan right next to the Yosemite Search and Rescue headquarters and having unrestricted access to the pioneer of search and rescue for Yosemite National Park and the US. John Dill, now in his 80s, had been at the, has been at the forefront of mountain search and rescue for over 50 years and has dedicated his life to the field. Uh, throughout the whole of the US, he is the only, he's only one of a handful of people who uh, has been allowed to remain a National Park employee, even though compulsory retirement's at 65. Uh, John will die in Yosemite working and living there. Uh, so other highlights back, in, uh, back at home. Um, so our objective is to undertake research that will benefit the Australian community at a local, state and national level receiving consistent feedback from emergency service organizations and rescue peers in other states, as well as internationally, was definitely validation to the relevance and importance of my research project. This is one example from SES in Victoria. And uh, see if I can read it there. I wanna thank you for taking the time and effort to write such a detailed and well-researched paper. Your report hits the nail on the head in every topic. I've been sending this report to my team and key members at select units to get them thinking about what we can um, what we can continue to develop as a service with some very positive responses. For me, reading your recommendations was like running through my checklist with everything. I've been pushing for a number of years now and what is needed to make sure we can operate safely and efficiently each and every time we turn out. Thank you once again for your hard work and writing such a brilliant report. And that uh, received similar ones from other um, agencies in other states. Um, along with writing, uh, submitting a written report to the Deputy Commissioner of the Queensland Fire and Emergency Service after I returned, I was successful in arranging a meeting with the then Minister for Fire and Emergency Services, Mike Crawford, at Parliament House in Brisbane. Um, and there we discussed my research um, and I was able to present my recommendations that required senior management support. So um, sometimes, you know, getting information up through the ranks can be difficult. So I sort of went to the top. Um, uh, that also attracted um, two assistant commissioners to, to join in. At a regional and state level uh, within the QFES, my research fellowship made immediate uh, impacts to the safety of rescuers and those being rescued, as well as directly involved in developing the mountain rescue capability uh, through course writing, instructing, and policy and procedure development. That said, there were many challenges along the way. Um, it's taken um, patience, perseverance, and around three to four years to successfully implement all the recommendations from my report. I'm extremely grateful to the Churchill Trust for enabling me to undertake this overseas research project and providing me with a platform to share this acquired knowledge in order to make a positive contribution to the Australian community. Your Churchill Fellowship will be a significant personal achievement and a significant event in your life. You will make lifelong friendships through your research and within the Churchill Fellowship community. So I wish you all the best uh, for your application and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Greg, that's fantastic. Um, all right, uh, um, with no further ado, I'll introduce uh, the second speaker, Fiona Ewington. 
Um, throughout a 20-year military career, Fiona saw operational service as a maritime warfare navigation specialist and marine pilot. More recently, Marty Ewington's work with the Navy's maritime trade operations capabilities focus on interaction between the Australian Defence Force and civil maritime industry. During conflict and competition, liaison between the warfare commander and merchant shipping is vital to ensuring free and open trade routes that support national prosperity. Fiona was awarded her Churchill Fellowship uh, in uh, 2017, and at the time was uh, living in Western Australia, and her project was focused on developing military doctrine on maritime trade operations employment to protect, protect trade interests. So um, you can learn more about Fiona and Greg's uh, fellowships through our website. You can find them by searching for their name uh, or the, the topic uh, keywords, and you can read their reports. But uh, for now, you can hear directly from Fiona. So thanks very much for the introduction, Adam. Hopefully everyone can see my screen there. If someone just wants to give me a wave or a thumbs up. Yep, perfect. Okay, awesome. So look, thanks very much to the Churchill Trust for the opportunity to talk to you all this afternoon. Um, I'm a real believer in the opportunities um, that a fellowship can provide, not just you individually, um, but your organisation and um, the greater Australian community at large. Uh, so as Adam announced there, my um, my fellowship was uh, came or the idea for it came out of an idea that um, if we're an island nation and more than 90% of our trade and that's everything that comes in and out of the country is moved by sea, um, given the strategic circumstances of the Indo-Pacific, um, what might that mean in times of conflict or emergency um, through to uh, significant um, you know, war um, events? And so whilst um, the Australian Defence Force and the Navy in particular had codified um, practices on doctrine and how we would potentially um, deal with those sorts of um, incidents, I was particularly interested in what our um, peers and complementary disciplines um, in our partner nations were doing, um, because as uh, in our part of the world, Australia took a lead within some regional security fora, but what is, uh, I guess, the big brothers and big sisters in the US, the UK, um, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization being NATO, what are they doing? Um, we know that um, we've seen writings and their procedures and practices, but how can we potentially apply that in the Australian context? Uh, so for me, it um, it was this identified uh, deficiency. How would we be able to work together? And you know, what can I do to improve that? So my fellowship involved um, six weeks overseas um, through Portugal, the UK, Greece, Germany, and the US. And this was visiting those defence establishments um, that we were likely to be working with in any sort of joint operation. So interoperability between military forces is quite important. And I wanted to look at the way um, they would approach a similar issue in their part of the world to see that what we thought we would do might be correct or how can we improve that. And for my application, a real um, cornerstone of that was um, an annual uh, shipping working group attended by all those NATO countries um, and from some other partner nations. Um, as a NATO partner, we were um, we had a standing invitation, and this conference brought together all the heavy hitters and the heavy lifters in my field. So I was really interested to talk to them but also to talk to some other organisations that weren't necessarily a subject matter specialist, but might have been employing and using the capability. Because I think with a fellowship, it's really important to start with the end in mind. If I'm solving a problem, I want to know that the answer I find is going to be of use um, 
to the broader organisations and those we're likely to be working with. Um, so for me, the highlights were definitely the people and the networks um, that were fostered. Uh, so that photo there is uh, was taken at the Striking Forces NATO. They have an awesome title, but Striking Forces NATO um, headquarters, which happened to be in Portugal. Um, and those two gentlemen I'm standing there with, one was German, one was Norwegian. Um, and they were the people that were in charge of organising and orchestrating navies at sea to protect um, the trade, to protect commercial shipping. So whilst they didn't fully understand the intricacies of how that would happen, I was, the area I work in would be um, working for and with those individuals. So that was quite a, a comprehensive part of understanding um, to make sure that I was solving the right problem that would be of use to our defence force. Um, and what I found out in that process is by taking the ideas that we already have about how we solve these problems and being able to benchmark it um, was quite useful in terms of evaluating our process and validating and in some ways confirm that perhaps we weren't as um, behind the eight ball as we thought and that what we were thinking and what we were training to and what we were enforcing was, was quite useful. Um, but being, seeing someone do that in an entirely different uh, geographical area um, was really you know, just quite amazing, kind of blew my mind in a way because they work under very different conditions than what we do in this part of the world. Um, what can you expect? Uh, some things went to plan and some things didn't. In my case, one of the real positives, one of the, uh, the opportunities was what I'll call contacts of opportunity. So these are people that you didn't necessarily think that you were going to go and visit and, and talk to and meet with during your travels and during your research. But as soon as you talk to one person in that location, they that face-to-face -face contact meant that, oh, look, there's someone else here I think would be interested in. And even if you couldn't fit it into your program, being able to follow up with that individual um, and have them contribute to your research was, was really valuable and I found that to be a great benefit. Um, probably not so uncommon to people these days, but I had a bit of a tale of luggage woe where I lost a bag for, or I lost all my luggage for 10 days, um, which was challenging in that it disrupted some of my program, affected the clearance that I had to go to certain military establishments because I didn't have uniform or I didn't have quite the paperwork and um, the program changed. And it just taught me that you have to be absolutely flexible when sometimes things don't quite go as expected. And when you're traveling by yourself, um, often that's different for a lot of us because we're used to working in teams. We're used to either going um, on adventures with family or with colleagues if you tend to travel in your professional role. Um, but the gentleman there with me um, was my US sponsor. He was my point of contact for the first day of meetings after I'd lost my luggage and he ended up being my guardian angel. And it was amazing how um, welcoming people would be in trying to help you um, facilitate your, your research and how can we still make this happen despite a few bumps in the road. Um, Publishing, dissemination and impact. I think I've already mentioned starting with the end in mind. So how is what you're going to um, propose? How do you scope that problem? Um, how is it going to contribute to the broader body of knowledge um, for the Australian community? Whether that's, um, and for many of you online, you might be working for a government department or other rather large organisation. So what are they going to do with this research? You can't just sort of write and do it for yourself. You've got to think about, okay, well, how am I going to get it, that, this information out there in what format? Um, and I found the opportunities provided by the trust in, um, in mentoring and talking to previous fellows was really um, useful to, uh, I guess, to challenge myself to think a bit outside the box in what am I going to do with all this knowledge that I gather whilst I'm away? 
And um, I think the time commitment is worth mentioning as well. So Adam at the start said, if you take one thing away, don't leave your application too late. And I would absolutely um, support that message because it's not just about something you have under your control. If you need to get professional um, referees along the way, then that obviously takes time. You've got to allow time for them to contribute and support your project and to find the right referees. And I think it's also useful to allow enough time for um, that thought bubble you've got at the moment um, to expand and mature, to work out, okay, if I can't solve all the, the issues um, around my particular area of interest, what part do I think is most important? And by handing that draft of your application to a colleague or to a friend, or in my case, I gave it to a 15 year old son who knew nothing about the topic at all. And I said to him, does this make sense? And have I removed all the jargon and the acronyms that um, defence and other government departments are really um, prone to using? So if I can't have a 15 year old of um, perhaps questionable personal hygiene, but rather average intelligence understand what my project is, then how am I going to be able to sell that to the selection panel? Um, and someone gave me that piece of advice early on and I'm convinced it's one of the reasons why um, ultimately I was successful. Um, so I've spoken to some of these terms already. So yes, um, give yourself enough time to prepare, be resilient. Um, perhaps the first referee you approach um, may not, they'll probably want to support your application, but maybe they're out of the office traveling or they don't have time. So come up with a backup plan. If at first you don't succeed, find the right person, find that champion within your organization um, or your environment, depending on the topic, who's going to help you. Um, and I think redundancy, if you front load a lot of the preparations and really thinking about the issue and doing some research on, okay, how would I solve this? Which organisations and individuals do I want to visit overseas? Maybe I don't know exactly who they are, but I need to reach out to some of the contacts that I have now and ask them, okay, so who in your country or within your, in my case, your arm of the military, who do you think is the elder brethren, the font of knowledge, someone that can help me with this process? Because ultimately I found that if you um, cast your net pretty wide and you're very appreciative of any help you get, people will really try to assist the process. And two other highlights for me. So these photos are interesting. The one on the left um, is from the Churchill War Rooms in London. So that's a wax figure. It's not a real person. Um, but it shows exactly what maritime trade protection looked like in World War II during um, Churchill, uh, the Churchill administration. So they're tracking merchant convoys carrying war supplies um, across the Atlantic that ultimately were... Um, uh, being hunted down by the wolf packs of, of German submarines. Um, and then on the right, though, because I went to Germany and um, had some fantastic discussions with their equivalent capability, their trade protection capability, uh, it led to um, a visit to a German submarine and the lady there is one of their first female submariners and she gave me a tour and it was just, you know, great to have that opportunity to explore a professional network. That wasn't something I was necessarily expecting, um, but a contact of opportunity um, and just, you know, to share of our common experiences serving at sea, me on the surface, her underneath, and, you know, what that had meant for our careers and, you know, what hopes and aspirations we had for it in the future. Uh, so, yeah, look, that's it. Thank you very much. And I'll hand back to the team. Excellent. Thanks, um, Fiona. Uh, fascinating to hear more about your experience and um, 
Gee, luggage, carry on. Can I just recommend, you can't beat carry on. Even if, if you just have a special bag with the most critical things in it, just keep that by your side. So I might ask um, Fiona and Greg to turn their um, cameras back on. We've got a few questions and I expect we might get a few more flowing in. Um, so or, already answered uh, was a question about um, whether or not you need to uh, have your meetings approved with specific organisations before you apply. And no, you don't need to. Um, I would, however, say that if you've got a super impressive person um, that who you want to meet with, I don't know, um, Melinda Gates or someone like that, then maybe the selection panel might have a question and go, do you really think you're going to? So if you go, actually, yes, you know, I know that they will meet with someone like me um, through just general knowledge in your sector or you've actually met them at a conference or something and they said, come and meet me, have that up your sleeve. Um, but generally speaking, no, like you don't need to have um, that lined up. Um, someone has asked about um, language barriers and how to overcome them if visiting uh, non-English speaking countries. And look, um, great question. Um, we can provide some additional funding um, to help with um, interpreting services, absolutely. So um, that's something that we are very happy to support. As you'd expect, the majority of people do go to the UK, the US, Canada, New Zealand. It's really easy. There's a lot of similarities, obviously, in some of our um, you know, uh, communities and the way we govern and the way we do things. But um, absolutely, um, interpreters can be supported. And I'd love to see people going to countries that perhaps are a little, little more um, out there and different. Um, that's a great experience and we could have a lot to learn. Uh, another question is the time frame. So is there a time frame within which travel needs to occur? Um, yes. So uh, you have 12 months um, is that window from when you're awarded um, to travel. And we've changed things up um, a gear, I suppose, this year in that you can travel from 1 November. So you'll know you're successful from mid-September. If you're really raring to go and the timing is right and you don't want to lose momentum, you can go from as early as November. So we'll give you till the end of November 2024. Um, obviously, things happen to people. They, they might change jobs. They might get sick. Um, unexpected things do happen. You can request an extension and we can um, typically give you another year if you have a really good reason to do that. So I hope that's um, answered that question. Um, uh, Jared has asked Greg, he'd like, he's interested in hearing how you went about seeking approvals from the international organisations you visited. How did you ensure the right person, the right rank person, um, approved your visit prior to the trip? So maybe you can answer that one. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I did a lot of work organising um, uh, meetings uh, before heading off and actually in my application phase, I, like Fiona said, start early. I started early. Um, there was, uh, I had one meeting with the head of the French um, training uh, facility uh, for their uh, fire and rescue. And um, I just kept tapping in the right, uh, into the offices to try and tap down to the right person. But then also you got to approach it different directions as well. So I made a contact with uh, one organization in the, in the US who gave me a contact with a helicopter pilot, a rescue helicopter pilot in France, who also <laughs> knew this person at the head of, in the head of this, uh, the training. So you'll find, like Fiona said, it's just uh, this whole network system. You just got to keep tapping from different directions and you'll find it's such a small world out there in your area, you'll find. Um, so majority of my meetings, I they all came off. Um, there was a couple of people I really wanted to see, but just at the last minute they were um, called away and you know, they teach internationally. But overall, I just kept diving down and, and asking up people and work the back doors a bit. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, all right, a few more uh, questions. So uh, someone's asked if the funding received went close to what was required and did you have to self-fund? So I'll, I'll start that one and say, look, we um, calculate your every fellowship based on, it's bespoke, based on where you're going and for how long the exchange rate, we, we get a rate um, at the start of each year that we work on. 
Um, and if there's a significant shift in exchange rates, we will adjust accordingly. So you get um, a living allowance that should cover your food and your accommodation. And look, typically it should be generous and it should cover what you need. But I guess part of that kind of choose your own adventure is if you want to stay in really expensive places, you're going to burn it up pretty quickly. Um, you can top it up if you want to, or if you're quite um, frugal. And like I think right now with inflation running the way it is, it is tougher than it has been in previous years. Um, but if you're quite frugal, you, know, you come back. Some people buy gifts for the people they meet with. It's sort of up to you. Um, maybe um, Fiona or Greg, you had a different experience to that. Uh, yeah, look, I'll back up what um, Adam said there. I found it was possible to do all of the travel um, within the budget that I was given. I thought it was about right, you know, it wasn't too much, it wasn't too little, it was sort of in the middle there. And sometimes it required a bit of creati creativity. Um, in some cases, I was pretty lucky in that um, some of the foreign militaries I visited, I could stay on the base, which cost a bit less than commercial accommodation, um, but I don't remember being materially um, out of pocket. Um, I know some colleagues when I was living in WA certainly managed to break up their fellowship travels with, say, a week of a, of a, you know, a holiday or a vacation in between to see contacts overseas that were of more of a social um, level and that was certainly self-funded which I think is entirely um, fair enough but if you've crafted um, a really uh, good tight scoped um, application and you can justify what you're doing I found the trust to be to be very forthcoming in yeah tailoring it to to cover things like your surface travel your air travel your daily stipend you know enough to to eat so that you're not you know having to sort of scrape by and, um, and you know, I, I found it um, a really, from a logistics point of view, really well coordinated. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Just conscious of the time, I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Um, and I guess a bit of a segue from that, as someone's asked, does the trust book the flights, et cetera, or is that done by the fellows? So we have, the trust has a centralised, um, we use flight centre management at the moment, um, travel agency, so it's really easy. You contact them, um, they organise all the options for your flights, including they can look at internal travel, that sorts of things. Um, and then that's booked. We pay for that. The trust pays for that directly. Um, you are given that living allowance, which you then are responsible for booking your own accommodation. Um, you decide where you're going and obviously use that, that um, daily living allowance for food and um, other things as well. Um, Someone has asked, Sue has asked, is it imperative to attend the event in October in Canberra? Could you attend via Zoom or similar if overseas? So, look, obviously, we really would want people to attend. We'd expect that some people might not be able to. And we'll be covering the costs of getting you to Canberra. Um, it's only for a day. Um, little warning here, like if, you, if you're sort of applying and you go to interview and you're talking about all the challenges of doing the fellowship because you're overseas, we're going to be thinking, yeah, we need to send you overseas because you spend a lot of time overseas. So just keep that in mind as well. I wouldn't sort of talk up being overseas all the time um, as a reason why you can't do things with your fellowship because we're really looking to give people an opportunity to travel overseas who might not otherwise have that opportunity um, as well. Um, and someone has asked about the itineraries. Is there flexibility um, once you've been um, successfully awarded a fellowship? Um, so if you start reaching out to people and you find that there's other opportunities, yeah, absolutely. So that's why we would say, you know, don't say I'm going to, you know, um, Germany for three days. Um, maybe say I'm going to go there for uh, a week and, and you might have a few little holes in your itinerary where you can... Um, fill in with other opportunities. Um, look, sometimes you find out that an organisation that did exist um, no longer exists. The COVID was pretty good at doing that. And so then obviously you need to um, come up with some changes to your itinerary. So we're, we're, we can be flexible. Um, I always use this as a really stark example, but if you're awarded a four-week Churchill Fellowship going to New Zealand, we're not really going to be able to churn it into an eight-week fellowship going to London and New York because that is such a massive cost difference. We've already budgeted for your fellowship. So we can be flexible, but probably not, um, you know, to the extreme. Um, so did you uh, have more locations than possible um, 
in the time frame and or how did you narrow down the itinerary to better align with your project goals? So um, maybe, Greg, did you find that you crammed your itinerary a bit too much or how did that roll out for you? Uh, yeah, I had a pretty full itinerary, but I wanted that my rest days were actually my travel days um, to move around. Um, yeah, and probably around week six, I got a bit um, bit crook when I was in Austria. I almost lost my voice for two days and then it came good after that. So you got to be, you have to be careful with it. Um, but I just wanted to make the most of it. And it's still, you know, I didn't, it was achievable, but I did. And if I went, if I went to do it again, I'd do the same thing. I, the, how I locked in all my um, tra uh, accommodation, travel, um, bus, plane, um you know car whatever just ran very smoothly okay and how about if you had a similar experience uh yeah so look i could have done mine potentially in four weeks i did it i think over six to seven and built in time so that example was good i could probably have done some countries three days all the interviews, but no, giving yourself a week, it just allows for a bit of a downtime and a bit of, you know, fudge factor in the case of any sort of travel incidents. And that was really good advice. I would not have done that um, initially, um, but when you come to put the itinerary together, yeah, really important to, to make sure you've got a, enough time to maintain um, your own sort of mental and physical health. Yeah, look, I think it's, that's a, that's an important point. And we do want people to like, have a weekend. So, Greg, you know, doing it again, I would say, yeah, don't make your rest days also your travel days because mm. travel can be quite exhausting. Factor in some time, you know, if, if there's some fantastic, um, you know, cultural attractions, go to them because it just helps you understand a bit more about the context, the cultural context of where you are and and just getting that, that you know, downtime. If you're travelling... You know, by yourself, it can be pretty lonely too. So getting some some time to actually get out there and see other people can be useful. Um, or if you're traveling with family, you might want to go and escape somewhere because you can't escape um, with them. So yeah, factor that time in. Um, Lee's got a question. Um, she says, I mentioned that projects can be on any topic. Yes. And I also note the information sessions that we're running are split into you know, domains or themed. Um, when it comes to the application process, do we need to nominate our project to sit within a particular theme? Um, look, uh, yes, you do. Now, just to backtrack on that, doing these sessions virtually like this is amazing. We used to do them face to face, which is also great, but you, you know, that's in a state context. This way, being national, we can bring people in on themes, which I think is just a bit more inspirational for people. And you can, you know, meet fellows that are you can relate to their projects and topics. Um, in terms of assessing the fellowships, we do have categories, we call them. So, you know, health and medicine or land commerce and logistics or the arts or whatever it might be. And that kind of draws back to those um, selection panels and committees that we have. We want to make sure we've got people from different sectors and we rotate them through over the years as well uh, to help us um, ensure that you, you get people that understand your project um, as best they can when they're assessing it. Um, so when you put your application in, you do nominate a category, but don't stress about that. Invariably, people say, but mine is arts and it's also education and it's also health. Where do I put it? Let's just put the one you think and then go to sleep and sleep well, because if it's not kind of aligning with our assessors, they'll get another assessor to look at it anyway um, to make sure that they're assessing it as best they can. So I wouldn't worry about that one um, too much. And we don't have... Um, uh, sort of set numbers that we allocate to different categories. So you're not going to sort of be advantaged or disadvantaged. Um, everyone's assessed on the, their own merit. Um, so I hope that that answers that um, question. Um, someone else has asked in relation to the itinerary, do you need to be quite specific about the days in each place? Um, we ask you to do it in blocks of half a week in the application form. So a week or one and a half weeks or half a week or two and a half weeks. Um, uh, so kind of leaving it fairly broad like that, but also specific enough that we can see that it's, you know, between the four to eight weeks. Um, so I hope that, that answers that. And also it does encourage you to think about a bit of um, space in your uh, itinerary. Someone's asked, being from government organisations, um, uh, were you representing your organisation while overseas or travelling completely, you know, removed? So I think that goes to that, you know, 
question that unfortunately I, I can say from my own experience having worked in, in federal government for a long time, it's not consistent even within state or federal government departments in terms of how travel's dealt with. And in some cases I've seen people need to get um, ministerial approval for their international travel, um, but they're not given leave, paid leave. They're taking their own leave. So it, it's a bit of a horse of the courses, but I'd be interested in Greg and, and Fiona's experience there. Yes. Uh, oh, you go, Greg. Uh, so, yeah, as I said in my um, presentation, I took uh, annual leave, long service leave, and, and I got two weeks of special paid leave. And I, before I went, I was, I was clashed about should I go down that road or not because it actually um, limited me, like it created a whole heap of um, pressures and, and problems. So I should just do it all on my own, even though my reason for doing it was to help the organisation and the community. And I was very close to just going, no, stuff you, you know. But I ended up going down that road. And, um, you know, the other thing there, and I had to get ministerial approval, et cetera, et cetera. And the other one is that the organisation then said, hey, you know what, I want the intellectual property. And I'm going, well, you can't because you signed that contract with the Churchill Trust. So that's something to consider as well. Hmm. Fiona? Yeah, in my case, it was um, yeah getting the clearance from Department of Defence uh, to go, and also perhaps the, the biggest issue for me was getting security clearances and so on in place to visit foreign military establishments. That was huge, and that was where the problem came from with losing luggage and that sort of thing. They didn't want me walking around looking like this on their base, and you know meeting high level individuals in perhaps not quite the the correct attire which again, very specific to the military, but there was a lot of legwork post um, successful application to, to put all that in place. I was really lucky. I thought I was going to be doing it just on unpaid leave. And at the 11th hour, someone within defence, once all the approvals had gone through, said that they would support it. Um, um, yeah, which was fantastic. But I had made the decision I was prepared to do it just on my own because it really can be problematic and it's obviously not consistent through departments or organisations. Yeah, so look, my advice um, is if you're applying in your, particularly if you work in government, um, you know, talk to your supervisor, um, talk it up the line, see if your secretary or deputy secretary or whatever the structure is of your organisation is interested and supportive. Um, early so that you know what you're in for and you can you can understand that. Um, it's not uncommon for, for government departments to offer um, some study leave or other you know miscellaneous leave for people and support them in it. But importantly, as Fiona said before, you know, start with the end in mind. You know, do you see yourself presenting to your senior executive about your your Churchill experience and what you learned? I mean that'd be great, right, in terms of being able to influence and impact. So see if you can Get that interest um, early on you might get a referee who's someone senior in your department that says if um, you know Adam does his fellowship like we fully support it and we'd love to um, you know hear from him when he's back and and whatever so keep those things in mind. Um, someone's asked if there is any budget for family to travel with fellows um, so we pay for the fellow um, if you want your family to travel with you um, that's at your expense Obviously, there's some economies to scale with accommodation, depending on how big your tribe is. But, um, you know, you can usually fit a couple of people in, in a standard kind of size room within your budget. Um, we do have uh, what we um, call a dependence allowance. So if your family situation is that you have um, children dependents and your household income is going to drop by 50% if you have to take unpaid leave, um, you know, I talk to the trust, give us a call and we can explain how that one works for you. That's a little bit of assistance in that situation, but not to assist travel. That said, if you um, need a, a carer to go with you, if you have a disability, for example, then we can fund a carer to go with you. Um, that's important to us and that's, that's something that we can do. Um, so um, I think that covers off actually um, Ayla's uh, question as well. Um, and also with uh, travel insurance. So you, travel insurance is provided as part of the fellowship. Um, and if your family is traveling with you, they will be covered for that period that they're traveling um, with you. So um, that's something to think about. Um, if applying for the community sector banking church or fellowship, you'll need a time machine. I'm sorry, because that one actually um, 
it's not offered anymore. So that was um, back in 2018 or 19, I think, and that was a, a sort of one-off. Um, so uh, apologies for if you found that on our website and it looks like it's still available, but it's not, but um, that doesn't matter. Just apply for a Churchill Fellowship and you'll be fine. Um, someone's asked, Greg, if you could expand on what you mean by intellectual property um, as their project will center on training they will need to use nationally. Uh, so all the information I gathered from overseas, they wanted to own it at the end of the day. And, um, and that wasn't what we were trying to do by the Churchill Fellowship. I'm there to try and help at a local, state and national level. So um, they wanted to keep it all in-house for, for them. Um, so yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't agree with that and um, we, we didn't do it. So I think, look, intellectual property comes up. Um, it's inherent in a church or fellowship. It's an obligation. You're signing up to it if you're awarded one. You will come back and share what you learnt. You're going to have a report that's available publicly. Now, there are some exceptions to that. Sometimes in matters of national security, you can't write that in a report and share it publicly. That's fine. So there'll be aspects of some applicants um, and some church fellows where they can't share certain information for national security reasons. Sometimes people say they meet with organisations and they, in confidence, will share some things with them that are sensitive from a commercial perspective. And what we say is, well, okay, just leave that bit out. Like, you can talk about what you can talk about, though, and, and do a report. But there might be some things that... Um, but in terms of you doing a fellowship, you know, absolutely okay if you get some, you'll get personal benefit from it in growth. You might get some information that leads you to be highly successful um, in your career, in a business. And that's okay, as long as you're willing to share that with the community and make, make it a benefit to the community. And that's not a problem. So we don't get too hung up on the intellectual property side of things from that perspective. Um, Nina wanted to know if we can help with the theme um, that you might put our application to. I'd say, look, just give us a call and talk to one of the staff about what your um, application project is and they can probably suggest a category to put it in. That's not a problem. Um, and goodbye, Amber. Thank you for attending. Um, now, someone's asked, they'd like to hear how each of you, Greg and Fiona, and we've probably got just time for this one answer, um, presented your application. So just to clarify, your application is online. This year is the first time you do a 60-minute pitch, so these guys got off the hook on that one. Um, but the, you could probably talk a little bit about your interview experience. Maybe, Fiona, did you want to start? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I, um, I was rather nervous going into the interview experience. I think uh, when you know you're going to be appearing before a panel, not just an individual, it's not like a job interview. Um, it, it's quite, uh, you know, you're quite anxious in advance. But once I got there on the day, the state um, organisations were fantastic at, you know, welcoming us, trying to allay those fears. It was certainly not a stressful process at all. I think if you go into it, having a really good understanding of what you're trying to achieve and how you're going to message that. How can you talk about it? And how can you be persuasive? Obviously, you're trying to convince the selection panel of the merits of your project, not just to you personally, but what does this do for the Australian community and, and how it can't be achieved by other means. Um, and when you work for government, I think, um, you know, that's that's a key part because the question can be, well, you work for a government department, why aren't they funding this research? And so if you can articulate perhaps why that is and why competing priorities divert the money elsewhere, but this is my grand plan and this is what I can deliver um, for you, then, um, you know, it, it was a really positive experience. And I came out having really enjoyed it, even if, it wasn't a successful application. I thought, well, you know what? I haven't had to sit before a panel like that for a while. This is this is fantastic. I've That's been the, taken the a lot out of it already. Um, the Churchill attitude. And I remember, <laughs> Greg, to just to reflect on your interview, I remember sitting at the table with about 100 people around it when you were there. So, Well, uh, there was a Supreme uh, Court of Queensland with a panel, of, I think, 16 people and uh, having a small table and a chair just in, in, uh, in the front row. And but same as Fiona said, um, everyone was fantastic coming into that, trying to just have a talk to you, get your nerves down. But you know, I just uh, I practiced walking around the back of the fire station, working out how I'm going to present my two and a half minutes most effectively. 
and um, like everyone was fantastic. And as soon as you stopped your presentation, the questions came in and uh, they were all great questions. So yeah, it was um, scary, but positive. Very good. All right, well, look, thanks everyone for attending. Thanks again um, to Greg and Fiona for your uh, wonderful uh, participation, presentations, and the work you're doing now with your fellowships and good luck to everyone who applies.